Hey everyone, uh, you're listening to People Building Businesses, the podcast from YBIT Ventures. My name is Jason Lim. Thanks for tuning in today. The guest on this episode today is Luna founder and CEO, Ronan Heine. Luna is a full suite startup studio that brings together uh, a bunch of legal and financial services together and purpose-built learning and development programs to founders who are looking to do things a little differently. Before founding Luna, Ronan worked as a corporate lawyer, suit and tie and all, for over four years with a top-tier law firm before finally venturing out on his own to start Luna in 2015. He's been an active figure in the startup community in Melbourne. Uh, he's floated around YBF and we've done a ton of things together. And I'm very, very excited to have Renan on the podcast today. So welcome, Renan. Thank you. So can I just say how naturally and well you said my name? Because oh, thanks. No one, no one, Renan Heine, you just nailed that. What, what, what does it usually come out as? It, it's usually really a ver- version of like Ronan. Ronan. <laughs> <laughs> Ronan, which is probably correct, and then the, yeah, the, yeah. the double thing is that my parents decided to pronounce it Heine, not Hine. So, good point. You know, I usually see people. I was, I was thinking, are oh, you going to fret over my name? There? <laughs> or, um, but you nailed it. Well, we've had the well, we've had the advantage of you know meeting outside of the <laughs> yeah, podcast yeah, and yeah, having it. lunch together and all that, which is actually a good place to start. I, I know you professionally in that sense, but I don't know. Renan from a personal perspective. So maybe I'll start with, you know, what was right. Renan like as a child? As a child. As a child. So I I was really only focused on one thing and that was making sure I played as much sport as possible and just made sure my parents spent all their time taking me to various sporting activities. So my, I, I actually think of my childhood as just trying to play sport okay. all the time. Any ones in particular that you excelled at? So I was the type of person who was playing footy and basketball and tennis and swimming and kind of just being okay or good at everything rather than mastering any one thing. Footy was probably the thing I pursued the most. Played a lot of basketball, but um, footy was sort of the thing that I kept going and tried to really nail and... Now my body's paying for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so at what point in your childhood did you go, okay, I'm, I'm going to pursue law? Or was that just a thing that was a spur of the moment decision for you as you were growing up? So funny, I was just having this chat yesterday with someone. Um, so for me, I actually avoided studying law. I did really badly at English at school, and that sort of scarred me into thinking, oh, I can't write. It's kind I of can't. a prerequisite. Yeah, yeah. I was, and I got into science law, but I... I diverted the law bit because I was so sort of scarred by being told I wasn't good at English. So I I couldn't, didn't have great writing skills. So I um, pursued biomedical science in the first instance, actually, because I liked science and I liked, I've always loved inventions. And so I went down that route, did biomed, uh, ended up uh, starting a PhD, um, looking at a drug therapy for diabetic eye disease and then thought, oh, well, I do not want, I'm sort of woke up one day I'm at the, in a, a lab underneath the Alfred Hospital I don't know if you know but underneath the Alfred Hospital is basically one huge science lab and animal lab and uh, I was going in there and going well what could my life look like I don't want to do this maybe I'll go back and study law and I got the confidence in my writing again and uh, so I went back to study law with this aim of kind of getting involved in the commercialization of inventions is sort of why I pursued law so that was yeah after a while so i wasn't that young when i just really truly decided to study law was there a big difference going from you know microbiology and science to to law was that a big big jarring experience for you or yeah completely different i mean um in some respects yes so so what wasn't different is you know in science you got to learn a process uh, you got to learn the structure to run an experiment and then a structure to report an experiment and then the structure to write up the results of an experiment. And in law, you know, it's also there's a structure. So you got to go in there and go, OK, cool, what's the structure? What's the methodology to some extent? So I found that quite similar. I think just being older when I studied law, you know, as opposed to being a 19 year old, I was pr- I, I'd already done a degree. Mm-hmm. I'd written a thesis. Um, so I was quite serious about studying at that point, you know, I was 24, I wanted to get out of university, um, and into the workforce. So, uh, I found, yeah, I found, found some similarities, not, not huge amounts, different, um, a different way of thinking, not so much at uni, but once you start applying law, um, or working as a commercial lawyer, that's totally different to science. Sure. And, and 
seeing that you're still in the industry doing law today, I, I'm guessing you've realized that it was a passion of yours to actually do law and to stay in it. No, so actually not. So for me, law was this interesting period because, um, so I'll, I see your face going, ah, interesting. Yeah, so, interesting. So for me, I've realized in hindsight that my passion has always been the invention side and law is what I'm really privileged and appreciate that commercial law helping um, learn how to set up businesses, hurdles businesses will face, take on investment, sell businesses, and that process um, is a skill I've learned that I now can apply to sort of the area that I'm passionate about. So first, I'm actually just really passionate about helping people with ideas, inventions, um, stuff that's addressing huge problems in the world. And I am just kind of feel privileged that I've got a skill set that could be useful in that process. Yeah. So I, I would say I don't love the law or live for the law or anything like that. Being a commercial lawyer, um, you don't so much look at, you know, regulations and legal developments. It, it's more practical. It's a bit more, oh, how do you protect intellectual property and how do you, what are strategies for negotiation and getting a better deal and, you know, terms of investment agreements and stuff like yeah. that. So. Yeah, I actually first and foremost just love the invention side and law is just a skill I guess I have that it's kind of like gets me in the door with really cool entrepreneurs, I guess. Yeah, it's hard to invent new uh, new new rules or yeah, new exactly. <laughs> constitutions or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, you know, in that respect, if you think back to science, yeah. it's totally different, right? Science is literally like, it's like, oh, cool, we're going to try this crazy thing right? and we're going to give it a go and we're going to think of creative solutions to do it. And laws more in the box thinking. Okay, cool. Like, what are the what are the what are the parameters that you can play in? What's the sandbox look like? And how best can you navigate that and apply it? Where do you think that love of invention comes from? Uh, probably, um, probably my dad. Okay. So my dad's an entrepreneur. He started a business when I was really young, and um, he's probably the one who I've looked up to in terms of just starting something and giving it a go. So that's like probably the person I think of. Um, aside from that, I think it was just being exposed to science. So I didn't realize this for a while. I, you know, I studied science. I loved invention. I loved that side of things. Then I did law. Mm -hmm. And when I was practicing as a lawyer, I was at a big commercial law firm. I wasn't doing anything to do with science or discovery. I was helping big businesses, sell assets, buy new businesses, a little bit of venture capital. This was ABL? ABL, yep. yeah. So, um, yeah, one of the big law firms here. And, you know, as a junior, I was just trying to make my way through and, you know, please the partner I was working for and, you know, my superiors at the time and just trying to learn and as you do as a junior in a big corporate environment. And I started to get exposed to startups sort of as a side project. And, again, that started to... to it, there was a, a light switch or a light bulb moment where I was like, oh, whoa, this is really cool. Oh, whoa, I love, I, I, there were some elements of the science world that I loved, particularly that invention, daring big. Yeah, tech. And yeah, and tech. And yeah, innovation. That, yeah, and innovation. And, and that's when I sort of really discovered that I, um, yeah, I just loved inventions, challenging problems. And yeah, that was the, the thing I loved. It, it's easy to do in hindsight. I, fi I find, I don't know about you, but, you know, when you're going through something, it's, it's uh, you don't always know your purpose you have a feeling towards it mm. but you don't understand your true um calling to it when you're in the moment and sometimes on reflection that i personally find uh you know why i did that or why that was a calling right yeah what was it like working in, in abl what were some of the expectations versus reality of working in a top tier law firm yeah so um so uh, it is an interesting environment. So it's because uh, I often get asked, you know, by young lawyers now, oh, don't I need to go to a big law firm to do, um, uh, to make it in the world? Or isn't it a, a good experience? And it, it is good. And there's there's a shadow side because um, what it's amazing for is structure, work ethic, um, dealing with high levels of stress, big transactions, being involved in the world, like, actually mm. being a contributing member to the business world and um, learning to navigate relationships. So um, back to your question, what um, what was it like? You know, as a junior lawyer, uh, it's cool. You come in, you wear a suit for the first time, you're in the city with all your <laughs> mates. <laughs> you're, finally, you're, you're carrying a briefcase, you're finally getting paid. Um, that's really cool. Uh, 
but it's a very different environment to studying law, for example. You know, you don't when you study, you don't track your time. Right. You don't track, you don't do billable hours. So, you know, the billing structure in a big law firm is set around billable hours. Um, and so in the back end, if you're charging clients uh, based on time, you know, it might be six minute increments, as you probably heard and people like to make fun of. In the back end, the junior lawyers are tracking their time and saying, hey, you know, this is what I'm spending my time on in six minute increments. And that's totally different to sort of, if you think about how you go to school and what you do at university, then all of a sudden you're doing that. It's a different way of thinking. Yeah, absolutely. So that was the biggest shift. And then it was cool. You're working with partners who, um, you know, uh, some good, some not so good, um, big personalities. And, uh, you know, the, the, so you've got to learn to navigate relationships, how, how you work with totally, you know, law firms have partnership models. Mm. So it's, you know, very different. Partners can be totally uh, different in approach style, management style, and learning to deal with different partners and right. how you juggle that is like a huge skill I learned. Um, and probably the, the other thing that a law firm is like, it's also cool. You work on these cool transactions. Um, by nature of being a lawyer, people come to you with their most important problems and they trust you. So, you know, as a junior, being able to sit in a room with someone who says, hey, my business is not going well, I need help, I'm gonna sell everything, um, I need to do this quietly, no one in my company knows other than you, I'm coming to you as a lawyer. Uh, that's kind of a privilege and as a, a 24 year old, 25 year old, 26 year old, it's pretty cool to be in that room and you know, just learn about um, businesses and yeah. sometimes it's successes, sometimes it's the others, sometimes it's, hey, we've got an offer on the table, for a, it's a deal of a lifetime. Again, maybe people don't know in our company, you're the first person we're speaking with, how do we navigate that? And yeah. I, I love that bit, that was really cool. Yeah, awesome. So, so you were having a, an interesting time learning and experiencing life in a law firm. What was then the, the light bulb moment when you kind of decided to start out on your own? Do you remember that moment? Yeah, so it, 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 um, it morphed over time. I, um, I started to get, so I just fell into a, uh, a group at the law firm that I was working at. You know, as a, as a junior lawyer, or when you come out of university, it's very hard to choose what you're passionate about. I was passionate about ideas, invention, commercialization of ideas. I wanted to get into biotech maybe, but I came out of uni in um, 07, 08 with the uh, GFC crisis and basically jobs were on hold for that sort of six month where people didn't know if the world was gonna blow up and mm. um, it was really hard to get a graduate position. So I just took whatever I could, never mind what I was interested in, I just needed a job. So I landed up in uh, a team at ABL, great law firm, so super lucky, um, that focused on private businesses and high net wealth individuals and their business dealing, setting up businesses, selling businesses, but we were working with private business owners, you know, it might be um, the founder of, company like Seek or car sales or, you know, but working with the founder on some, on their private business dealings as opposed to acting for the ASX company and a board of directors. Gotcha. So that we started to build personal relationships. So they would come to us and say, hey, you do this great work for our business. Uh, my son, my daughter's dropping out of university to start a tech company. They've got this website they're building, you know, you're talking sort of six, seven, eight years ago. I don't know what they're doing. I'm gonna give them some money, but my one requirement is that they come see you first and so my partner would go great um the firm would say fantastic that's the next generation love to support you know they're young up and coming so we won't charge them handball to the junior lawyer in the team to do you know his non-billable work late on a sunday night outside of the other work <laughs> and i just started to pick up bits and pieces of that work the same sort of with social enterprises people you know there was this world of there's charity and then there's business and then you start to see the to emerge, we start to see some of the clients we were working with on their business saying, hey, you know, there's a cafe we want to uh, uh, set up that's gonna fund a not-for-profit that I'm a director of. Can you help set up that cafe? And this idea of social enterprise started to come. And again, the same type of principle firm would say, yeah, great. All right, we'll do it. Pro bono, handball to the junior lawyer later night. So I started to pick up work for young um, startups mm. uh, and social enterprises. And then I started to fall in love with uh, those businesses and, and, and start to learn about that approach to business. And then I started to realize that the approach of taking corporate legal services, this is how Luna started, the idea of taking corporate Luna corporate legal services and applying it for free to a startup is, and the startup should be thankful and lucky. Well, it didn't really work. 
A, startups have a completely different approach to business. The, the business model, the mindset, what you need, it's fundamentally different. Even to the, the ability to afford certain costs as well. Exactly. So that was fundamentally different. The, um, the approach of a young entrepreneur, um, when I say young, young at mind, uh, is totally different to an experienced corporate veteran. You know, let's call it a 50-year-old uh, gray-haired dude in a suit and tie. You know, we all work in the startup world here and probably the listeners do too. It's... It's totally different. So the experience of going into a big CBD office to meet with, um, you know, 50-year-old men mainly in suits and ties, you know, um, triple three Collins Street, beautiful building, but it's intimidating just walking in there. Um, you know, so the experience is, is off. So never mind you're doing it for free. You know, I had some people I was working with and I remember they walked into, this was probably the moment, they walked into the meeting. After the meeting, they turned to me and said, hey, I could feel they were nervous the whole meeting and we're on their team, we're their lawyers and they said, hey, you know, this is so funny. This is the first time I've worn a shirt all year. Oh, wow. Yeah, and you're like, all oh, right, well, why does it need to be like that? Why does it, legal services have to be intimidating for young people, unaffordable um, and delivered in, you know, it kind of, they almost felt bad being there. And so mm. that was the starting point. I started to think about how I could do that within the firm I was in um, didn't really see a path forward there. You know, they're, they're focused on corporates as are all big law firms. You know, Australia is a big corporate environment. Five years ago, um, what was happening in the startup space here? Just starting. There's yeah. a core group. But not much. Not much. So startups weren't quite a thing. Uh, and so I started to see all these other inefficiencies in how um, young entrepreneurs were accessing advisors and services like legal and accounting and how they were handling investment. These were the, the companies I was working with and I could just see a huge disconnect that they were raw, young, had never started businesses before uh, and it was hard just navigating relationships with a lawyer to an accountant, to a, an investment advisor, to someone else who's a mentor who's helping them with hiring. And so that's where Luna started with this idea of, well, how could we build a service that helped raw, young entrepreneurs uh, with business services they need yeah. to start a business because you need that stuff. So when when your comp when Lu when Luna first launched, it was called hashtag corporate advice. Yeah. So was hashtag corporate advice something that you were building while you were preparing to leave ABL, or was it something that you only launched after you left ABL? Yeah, funny story. So um, I consider it the worst name of all time, and our <laughs> team just completely laughs at me that that's what happened. But to tell you the truth, it went something like this. So. I um, didn't mean for that to be our uh, name. Uh, I was working on this project whilst I was at ABL and I was doing lots of like inspiration outside. I was going to conferences. I was going to meetups. I was scouring the internet for ideas and I started taking huge amounts of notes on what could this be. And in my head, I was like, great. This, this, what we need is a service delivered by young people that's not legal advice it's not accounting advice that's a mixture of services delivered for young people so um i didn't i literally if you looked in my notebook the first heading would be project mixture of services for young people delivered by young people and i couldn't be bothered writing that the whole time so i just decided oh, okay cool float back six years ago what represents young people a hashtag what's something that's like not legal advice not accounting firm what's like a combo of both corporate advice so in my notebook i just started writing hashtag corporate advice for myself yeah for no one else and then i left abl and um with this vision to start the business i was going to take a few months to de develop a little bit and then i just got hit with a um couple of clients that i'd been working with you know those startups on the side that i had been working with um, hit me up and said, hey, why don't you come in and do some stuff for us? You can learn about the startup world. Maybe you can give us some services. We can do a bit of a, an arrangement. Why don't you put something together? And I was pretending that I had a business, right? So my sister's a graphic designer. I had this name, hashtag corporate advice. You know, I got her overnight to sort of put together some branding. I sent a proposal through. And then I just got really busy really quickly. And all of a sudden, that was our brand name for the first Year and a half, two years. Yeah, yeah. It makes for a good story, though. Yeah, <laughs> but it's ridiculous. I used to make the team do like hashtag signs, yep. and we just like really embraced the hashtag. I thought it was going to be a cool thing, but turns out maybe it's a bit tragic. <laughs> well, we'll get into the rebrand just a little later, but I, I want to dig into the early days of being a founder for you because yeah. 
starting a, a company in this industry is so different to a software startup where you actually know what you're going to do. You're going to build a product and you're going to scale that and you're going to you know find customers. But it's a very different process for a company like like Luna, like mm. Azure Corporate Advice. Uh, so what were, what were the early days like? How do you find customers? Yeah, so I'm... Um so I got really lucky. So I, pl the plan early days was to do the completely wrong thing. So my plan, the day I left the law firm, was to spend six months to develop pricing, packages, um, build a website, marketing mm. material, and then I would launch and then everyone would come running through the door, you know, that whole approach. I didn't do that luckily. I just by chance some people approached me and said, hey, why don't you come freelance? And then I went, whoa, okay. I need to explore the problem a lot more and have to understand the startup space. It's not about me providing services to the startup space. So I guess that's similar to, you know, a product business in mm. that first step is understanding the problem, falling in love with the problem before attempting to create a solution. So that bit I would say is actually quite similar. So I, by chance, just spent because I got pulled in right. there. I, I wasn't intentional about it. Um, now I would be now that I've learned a, a bit more about business and and the startup world, uh, but I started testing and just providing services to to startups. So being a service business versus a product business, you know, it's actually quite easy. A service business is you and you test your service out on people and you get feedback. You, you try and negotiate a price point, does that work, what didn't work, and then there you go again. So um, for me, the principle that we started off is the same principle we applied today. Try create value to the your customers and that's what we chase. We just chase creating value. If we're creating value for them, they will use our service. Mm. And if we create enough value for them to recommend us to a friend, then we will create value for them and a friend. And then the network effect starts. Sure. So that's really the principle that we, we run off is just trying to create value and yeah. have impact. And you're a team of over 20 people now today, but what was your first hire like? Oh. My first hires were great. Yep. <laughs> the best. Are they still with uh, the company? So one is. Yep. Um, the other one still owns our Slack group. Yep. So awesome. in spirit, we call him the supreme leader because yep. he's just there. <laughs> but I, actually, it was quite a funny story. So the first two people, one was a paralegal at ABL at the time. Mm. I left and he called me up and said, hey, uh, I heard you left. I heard you're doing something with startups. You know, you, you were really... You were the nicest person to me <laughs> in my experience as a paralegal there. I really enjoyed working with you. I'd love to help out. And I said, oh, that's really nice. Um, I have no money. We have no clients. We don't have an office. We've got nothing. But if you want to come and, you know, spend a couple of days a week, you're, he's a, a law student, sure, like all for it. He said, oh, great. You know what? My dad has, a, um, has an office. So he's actually got a spare office next door that he's not using. You oh, know, wow. you're welcome to use that office. <laughs> so we went to the law student who's volunteering for me had organized for his dad's office to be available for us. And we set up shop in his office. You got an office from day one. You got an office from day one. Um, it was in Malvern on High Street. And good spot. Yeah, beautiful spot. <laughs> really lux from the start. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, probably the wrong target market around that, <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. that area. Not really known for young dynamic startups. <laughs> so BMW is passing by. <laughs> That's it. But uh, so he he started. Then a friend of his at uni heard that he was having this amazing opportunity of volunteering for free right. uh, and providing me with free space through his dad and his friend said, "Oh yeah, I'd love that opportunity <laughs> as well." More free space. <laughs> so he came and said, "Hey, can I also do some work?" And so I had these two um, law students who were just keen, eager, want to learn about startup social enterprise. They also had no idea what they were getting into. And we just, I don't know, somehow built a business from there. So they, they were really fundamental. Like they, um, they enabled me basically to go out and meet people. I had learned uh, through my experience as a lawyer, I'd learned how to um, build, train people, um, delegate work, uh, work with other people to be able to deliver services. So um, that's basically how we started. So one is now, he was always interested in, so Devin, the Supreme Leader guy, um, shout out to Devin. <laughs> if he's listening. If he's yeah. listening. You better be. He will be. So uh, he um, he's always been interested in social justice and, mm. um, you know, I, f I have a feeling that he's going to get involved in litigation and, and you know, um, help 
do good in the world. So he's um, he's working in a government department at the moment, um, doing some amazing stuff. I think he's doing uh, about to do stuff with native title rights and some some really incredible work. And then Ben, the other guy you might have met, Ben, he uh, he's yeah he's been with us since then. So he's since he's finished uni, he's um, you know been with us for four years now, two years as a lawyer. He is a leader in the investment space. He's basically doing I would say more early stage deals than any other lawyer I probably know. You know, every week he's basically just doing a deal and he's incredible. That's cool. Yeah. So you seem to have gone against conventional wisdom by, by being a solo founder. Yeah. Everyone says it's a horrible idea. It's a horrible idea. I agree. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm guessing you had a really stressful time starting up the company. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I just didn't realize that... Um, I think I'd just been exposed, you know, I guess maybe reflecting, I'd seen my dad who started a business by himself and, right. um, and he had bad experience with a partner. I mean, this is subtle and, you know, I remember him getting like having a fallout with his partner and then taking over the business and maybe that stuck with me a little bit and mm. a lot through the corporate, um, world, like private wealth, high net wealth individuals and the work I was doing at ABL as well, more traditional business bit of a focus on protection of equity mm. versus the startup world where, you know, it's like monopoly money we're flying around. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> um, monopoly notes of sorts. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and there was a different approach. So I probably entered it with a bit of that mindset. This is my idea, my thing. I, I need to build a team and the team will support me to do it. Um, and I, I just wish I spent more time. I, it, it changed for me. About, about a year, I was like, whoa, I need, I need some help here. Imagine what we could achieve with um, some business partners or co-founders and I wish I spent more time at the start so sort of after that first year I actually spent a lot of my time um, searching for business partners or co-founders to come in so since then I've been able to do it you know they didn't start on day one so Tess um, yep. who you would have met she I heads have, up yeah. our legal team uh, she's a business partner Dan uh, Ross heads up our accounting team same thing so he's the leader of that team and and last year we brought on uh, Sam Dupree so I've essentially got now uh, what I would call like three co-founders alongside me and it, it, it's a different relationship because they're not the founder from day one yeah. um, but there's finally people to lean on and it it's we had a really big year last year and it just coincided with having those people. And but how do you find these people? Because in, in a profession like law and you know finance, it, the career path seems so clear for anyone who's not been exposed to startup world. You mm. can join a firm like you did in ABL and you sort of work your way up and eventually become partner. Yeah. But how do you convince these people to come on board to, to what's a risky venture? Huge. Um, ins I had to inspire. Mm. So for me, um, it wasn't so much on the, it wasn't, so, on one hand, yes, like the traditional environment is clear cut and people know which way they're going to progress. But you'll find, and you speak to any big law firm, big accounting firm, they, they have trouble in general say, oh, engaging millennials, like the, the young we have, we, we just can't get our people to stay beyond three, four years. Mm. Um, you know, people, the old way used to be, oh, you know, you do your time, 10 years, and then you make partner. And people want to have impact from day one. They don't want to do the work. You know, they're okay for a year or two just doing what the boss says. Yeah. But then they have a light bulb moment where they're like, hey, I'm, I'm 27. I'm, I've been high achieving my whole life. I worked hard at school. I went to law school. I had to do well to get a job at a big corporate law firm. You know, now I'm 26, 27. And I'm totally capable of speaking to a client. I want to I want to be I want to be using these skills that I've developed and they start to look at their peers you know if you're going to a, a marketing field or if you start a startup and they look at them and go hey I, I'm meant to be the high achieving person you know because most right. you know you have to do it's hard work to get into law and they go whoa I want to I want to have impact in the world yeah. so um, you have to inspire them so for me to get people like that you know to, to get test to come on board the main thing I needed to do as an example was show her vision inspiration and mm -hmm. communicate and, and get her trust that with me and her together we, we could do that and so it was you know you don't inspire overnight it's not like a job application you put up and you get people for a role and you do some interviews and run a four-week process a lot of conversations probably with each head um, the conversations went for at least six months yeah wow that's yeah. a long conversation yeah and that's actually a great segue into my next question. You know, it, it, 
as a founder and as a CEO of a business, uh, particularly in the services industry, how do you create that vision? It, it seems like it's not clear cut how you would set that you know big audacious goal compared to a company like you know like a product company like yeah. Facebook. You know? connect everyone in the world like how do you do that with a company like like luna yeah so um we we steal a lot of things from the startup and tech world so we we think about things in more of a product way than a service way you know we um yeah we're providing services and it's people delivering the service but we have productized a lot of what we do and mm -hmm. a lot of our internal language um speaks more like a, a product and in some respects a little bit like a software business so right um how do we do it? We also have a big vision. You know, our our mission, our reason for being, is to help. On a, so there's we've got like a social mission, which is how can we play a role in engaging more people in entrepreneurship in Australia? Because we have to change the way this economy is built, right? So it's not we can't you know dig shit out of the ground anymore no, and and, forever, yeah. and and sell it to the world. And we we see a huge opportunity in entrepreneurship and you know, to, to steal some language from, I guess, what um, other eco, small ecosystems, you know, exporting our brains and our inventions mm. and our, you know, discoveries. Mm. And so on a social level, that's what we're passionate about, about engaging more people in entrepreneurship. Our mission, if you like, is to help launch and grow better startups from Australia. Mm. So that's what we're trying to do and striving to do. And through that is how we choose and determine what services we provide right, right? so um, we know legal and accounting as an example are just two critical services for building a business if you're going to build a better business uh, you need to have those um, two elements we know that there's hardly any people in the context if you think about all the people supporting startups those that are lawyers and accountants specifically that actually understand startups you know, I'm sure you've been through it. Yeah. You probably can only think of like one, two or three of those types of people, but That's those true. are those are core services to startups. Mm. So you would think that um, the supply of those services would be really high. You know, every startup needs a lawyer, an accountant, yeah. right? So uh, it's, uh, yeah, we start with the vision and then we think about the services that are needed for people to better achieve yeah. that vision. So we do have vision and mission and stuff like that yep. and, and it seems like you've set up the company and, and the people to really be forward looking and you're kind of predicting the trends of what of what people tr who traditionally want to practice law are looking for now like you said a lot of young young professionals really believe that they should be doing more with themselves that they believe that they've got potential yeah. that's untapped in these big law firms and you yeah. also see that you know law and finance need to be productized in a way that makes sense for for these startups how do you think the larger firms need to adapt it's so hard, you know, the problem with the larger firms is they've got so much infrastructure, like everything from the structure, the setup. So they're a partnership. Mm. A partnership is different from a private company. In a private company, there's legacy succession, stuff like this. Partnerships sometimes, you know, there might be a, a thousand partners around Australia. They've got competing stuff. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Sure. They're earning like they, that they've been working in an environment like that for 20 years. They they're earning great money. They they want to protect that and they want to retire. And that's kind of the legacy is, yes, they want the people below them to um, do well and maybe yep. take over their client base. And yes, there's alignment to the firm, but often there's like, hmm. you know, misalignment. It's not like a succession of a, a regular company. So the partnership structure, I think, makes it difficult for them to go, great, let's, I've, you know, if you think about someone who's been at the firm, you know, let's say they've been there for, 10 years, 15 years, and they've finally made equity partner. And now they're getting that lumpy big check that they've sweated for 15 years to get for them to go, wow, okay, you know what? We're going to risk this all now to change and do a completely different business model that doesn't rely on billable hours. It's just really, really hard. And so, um, you know, the whole system, the whole way they manage people, it's all geared around that billable hours, um, beautiful big corporate offices, leases in the nicest buildings in the city. How do you change that? It's it's really hard. So you think the future is with companies like Luna? Well, I think, th I think the future is with companies like Luna. I think, um, you know, it's, and, and that doesn't have to be from entrepreneurs out on their set, on, by themselves you know something that i i keep going over in my mind is you know when a big corporate says hey you know i want to do corporate venture right i want to do um we want to get involved in startups because we need to nurture 
startups and we believe in tech and we believe in we want to work with high growth companies and we need to see them earlier than um we're seeing them because we're missing out because they're working with people like us i don't think you can just say great we'll have a focus in our team in our office and the startups can come into you know a big cbd office you know they need to set up micro offices Mm -hmm. or environments in places like this and not just have a couple of people be here but you know, it's it seems like a shame to me that a company like Luna wasn't started out of my old firm where they go, hey, you're doing this thing. Why don't we just back you, go over there, and let's work collaboratively a good point. together. Yeah. So um, I think, you know, it it's speaks to a bigger point. Um, that's not just a problem with, say, legal and accounting, but how do big corporates uh, get involved in the startup space? You know, you would probably see the same problem with big corporates setting up startups themselves and you know that they 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 suffocate them within and sometimes they're better off to say hey go off over there and fly we'll back you from afar but yeah do it yourself somewhere else yeah absolutely a big part of what ybf does is to help corporates try to figure out how to how to spin stuff off and and adapt to innovation and change absolutely yeah so i think what lander and rogers have done here is like fantastic right absolutely yeah um and that's great because it seems like they just they really support and let it be and you know it's Mm -hmm. not within the office environment, the traditional office environment, which is busy and billable hours and partners, you know, would go, why is my junior working on this thing that doesn't make me any money tomorrow? And, yeah. you know, so just having it out here, I think is, is great. So y- you've obviously seen a lot of, uh, a lot of companies start and end and, yeah. and you've been through the life cycle of a company from its earliest days. What are some, what are some common mistakes you see startups make on both the legal and accounting and finance side of things? Oh, cool. Um, So the biggest mistake, I think, is uh, not working on the founder relationship. Interesting. So that's, you know, at the end of the day, ideas are uh, a dime a dozen. Everyone has good ideas. Um, It's the implementation and execution of those ideas that builds a business. And then what is implementation and execution? It requires people, requires a team. In order to have build a team, teams ultimately build businesses. Yeah, at the start, you can be one or two people. You have a product, it goes bananas. But eventually, there's going to be a point in time where can you build a great team mm-hmm. and a great culture to keep delivering this amazing product, service, and change the world, right? And it starts with the founder relationship. So we see um, we've got some data that shows 60% of uh, – startups um, will have a founder dispute early on, right? So that will happen. If I were to just off the top of my head, think about the amount of founders who think about their relationship at the start. When people start a business, everyone's excited. Mm. It's like, we're starting a business. You're awesome. I'm awesome. We're going to do this. This is great. I could definitely work with you. You could definitely work with me. And you don't really think about it like you would a marriage, for example, or a relationship. You just think this is going to be great. And so not many founders at the start actually go, okay, cool. Like, let's work out what happens in, you know, a year's time. This isn't going so well. Or let's put some stuff, like, let's agree what some roles would be. Nothing like heavy, legal, but just that basic discussion around, you know, let's put some expectations together. What are you going to work on? What am I going to work on? What, What happens if we want out? Yeah. Those, that, that basic thing. So we see lots of founders yeah. um, getting into trouble with that because what happens is down the line, it might even be two years, three years, you know, they, they, they never had that conversation. They didn't develop that relationship between each other. And then a founder wants to leave. If, if founders end up squabbling. Yeah. Company doesn't go anywhere. It's very hard to build a company. Kills a company. It kills a company. So the idea is amazing. You've got traction. You've got sales. We've had companies that, you know, they, they're doing millions of dollars. They could be a high growth startup. Sure. And then they start to have founder disputes. And then all of a sudden, it just gets put on hold. Maybe they miss an investment round. Maybe they, they get killed off. Maybe they do recover. But it's just something that I think is such an easy fix at the start that um, that it's worth... Uh, it's just worth doing. And probably the other big mistake we see for founders is spending a, a lot of time planning and not enough time just just go out, roll up the sleeves right. and doing, right? So when you talk about the legal and accounting stuff, people might want to, you know, this is maybe even counterproductive to, to business for us, but in the long run it's not. But, you know, they'll want to come in and they'll go, oh, you know, I'm starting a business, I need to 
big financial model because I need that. You know, I better get business plan. Yeah, I better get the business plan. I better get those terms and conditions because I'm going to have a platform that's mm-hmm. going to change the world, and I'm going to need employment agreements, and I'm going to need all these things because I'm starting a business. And you're like, hey, you haven't even tested out your prototype yet. You haven't built your prototype yet. Um, you know, you, you don't have investment. Why you've got ten thousand to spend? Why don't you why don't you run experiments with that ten thousand dollars? You know, let's set up the minimum stuff you need. But there's no point going crazy on a financial model or going completely bananas on your terms and conditions. And you, you don't know what your business is going to be in a week or two months from now. So, um, yeah, that's another problem we see is, you know, p- people sit in the planning phase. And, and I think on the legal and accounting side, that represents they're probably doing it in other aspects. You know, instead yeah. of just getting out there, they're trying to build a perfect website, you know, sure. and, and just planning 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 instead of just rolling up the sleeves getting out there testing 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 so do you offer advice to these companies in terms of how to avoid these issues yeah you, you'd be staggered the amounts of times people will come into us and want something and we'll say hey that that's great that you want that and you, we could charge you for that but yeah. why don't you go do x y and z test it out and then come back to us and we can actually then work out what you need and where this this thing is going. Yeah, so all the time. It's probably like a daily conversation our team has with entrepreneurs. Is that something you 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 expected when you first started Luna, that you would act as sort of like a mentor and advisor to these companies, not just their lawyer? Uh, I mean, I, I wished for it. Like yep. that was kind of the, the dream. That's what I, 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 I wanted for the business to be the true trusted advisor, you know, someone who could go and say, hey, you're a point of contact, you understand finance. Your, your team understands legal, your team understands investment, your team understands how to build a sustainable business. Instead of me having four relationships with people who are all saying different things, one point of contact mm. who can help navigate those things. So um, it was, did it was the intent. I didn't really know how to bring it about. It kind of happened organically uh, because for me, the way I had learned legal services in particular was if someone comes to you and wants legal advice, you better give them everything. You better protect yourself. You better say, hey, if you're starting a business and you need all those 10 things and because you're a lawyer and you want them to have the best legal protection ever yeah. and say, this is what you need and this is how much it costs and try to convince them to take that even though it's not the best thing to do for building their yeah. business. So, so uh, how do you think about scaling and growing your business? Because it's it's not... For for a lot of listeners here, they're they're used to talking about startups mm. and you know costs going down as your revenue goes up and you know but but it's different for a services business or totally. you know, even a, even a productized services business because your your costs kind of grow linearly yeah. based on headcount based on the amount of work that yeah. you, you get so how do you what's your strategy to scale Luna yeah so for us our financial model unit economics are, are like so critical right and something we have to look really closely at you know what what do our margins look like um, on services and products and knowing which which services are profitable mm. and which ones are not profitable. And that's okay when they are and there aren't. Our model in general, um, in some respects, we think about Luna as well a little bit like a, a venture capital fund will think about their portfolio. Right. So I'll explain what I mean. So, um, you know, a venture fund will say, hey, we are going to invest in 10 companies. This is startups. This is tech. We're going to take 10 bold bets. We know that not all 10 are going to make it to five years. We know not all 10 are going to make it to exit. We hope. We wish. We dream. Our intent at the start is we think each of these have, have the opportunity. But realistically, our financial model, our ability to return to uh, investors means the top few need to make it really big and – the anything else you know out of the bottom seven if you like that's 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 a bonus right yeah. so if our top top few become unicorns we're going to return to investors yeah sure so we apply a similar model we don't it's not about returning funds to investors or startups having exits but for us our model is geared around getting a certain amount of the startups that we work with early on through launch which is what we call zero to two years into growth two right. years plus so once a startup is in like the first zero to two years taking a bit of money running lots of experiments core team really small really really lean 
two years plus, they start scaling up. It goes, you know, post Series A or post, they start to have 10 plus employees, revenues, you know, in the millions, their, yep. their impact, the growth potential, the, they're starting to scale up. So the way we work is we know we have to work with a certain amount through launch. And then once the startups get to growth, we can do a lot more work with them. And so that's a lot of our focus is, are we working with the right companies? Mm. Do we have enough companies that have gone through launch and that are in that growth phase? And that's how our, our model works. So it's less about focusing on headcount, uh, sort of squeezing people dry, trying to getting the most out of the people. We know what our people are capable of yeah. and they're in, they've got metrics and KPIs and what they need to deliver. But where you spend a lot of time focusing on do we have the right startups that yeah. we're working with sort of like if you were if, we, if you were there at the start for like a company like canva or atlassian exactly and if they grow to become unicorns you're yeah. sort of like the trusted advisor and yeah you grow with them as yeah, well Yeah, exactly and so um that's our model so yeah. you know a lot of those companies we started with four years ago uh, uh, doing that series a plus now yeah. and now and, and then we, there's all sorts of other opportunities that come sometimes we get companies that our series B, series C, just coming to us for pieces of work because we get the startup space. Mm. But a, a core thing we look at, yeah, is seeing the companies work with. VCs Great. say no so often. Do, do you have to say no to startups looking for, for help? No. So, um, again, we have that general social mission mm. um, of engaging people in entrepreneurship. So what what we our model is, so going back to launch and growth, we've got two versions of service. This is through everything we do. This yeah. is through legal, this is through accounting, this is through financial advice, this is through um, programs and education and workshops we run and knowledge, launch versus growth. So in launch phase on the service arm, yep. low touch, highly kind of automated. We've got a lot of tech in there, some tech in there. We're fortunate yep. to work with a lot of startups. Um, so shout out to Joseph, for example. Yeah, yeah. Who, who Joseph jo are great. Yeah, Joseph are great. They're in here. So, you know, they've helped us to automate a lot of the legal experience awesome. in the launch, launch phase. And so um, we're able to deliver an affordable service that protects a startup for everything they need at a much lower cost to, to traditional services. So the barrier to entry is really, really low for them. And we're able to work with them then. And then they they, they um, self-determine who makes yeah. their way through to growth. You know, if you, you just don't make it sure. through that, that period. You can't get investment, you can't get investment. If you can't get investment, you need to find another way. If you can't find another way, eventually the company, you'll, you'll need to start again and that's all right. Shout out to Tom and, and Sam and the rest of the team at Joseph who are also part of the Lander and Rogers yes. uh, Logic Hub. Uh, so we've got time for just a few more questions. Uh, I want to quickly touch on the Luna rebrand. Cool. What was, talk us through the process of rebranding yeah. into Luna. Um, painful, <laughs> painful, <laughs> painful. So we knew um, once it had gone beyond me and uh, the two law students in, uh, you know, a little office in Malvern, um, we realized we had something. We, we realized we were building a community. We we're doing good work. We real customers were coming back to us saying, hey, we love this and we're a, telling all the people we work with or we know who are starting businesses to come to you. So we started to get rolling. And so we needed to build a brand and then we started to hire a team and we had a bit more of a team and um, we needed a, a brand to support us. And it was just like a long process. We started, you know, people think about branding as um, what you see, like the logo, but actually a brand is mostly what you don't see. Mm. You know, it's, 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 beneath the surface you know what is a brand there's a logo which people see but there's values within there's an approach there's a, a work style there's a certain brand that goes with each individual in the company uh and, and that all makes up the brand so it started off with us um looking at who we were who we want to be purpose uh, mission and all that stuff you know w w what type of brand and um, image we wanted to portray so we did a lot of work on that space first then eventually we started to get into the um, the naming space and that was just horrendous. It was like <laughs> we came up with names and each day we're coming to the whiteboard with new ridiculous names. Yep. And we had these requirements on what we wanted to be. We, we wanted to um, be sort of a forward-thinking, dreaming big site type of brand. We didn't want to do the thing where you're like, um, you know, lots of people have names like to – like particularly in the advisor space. Right. So, you know, there's people that you'll, you'll have, oh, cool, like our Heine service. Heine & Co. Exactly, Heine & Co. Or we'll set up a new arm. It's called 
Frank, right? Yeah. Like Frank, there's a law firm that does that, <laughs> so maybe I'll get in trouble. But, you know, there's lots of um, people who will set up a brand as, a, as an individual's name. And we knew we didn't want to make the problem worse by doing a male's name as if we're a male name. So we wanted to use a name. We wanted it to be a female rather than a male identity or, or gender neutral, right? Mm. And we wanted to have a dream big aspect. So those were kind of like some requirements and we were just coming up with the worst names ever. Right. And then uh, then one day it just landed. I don't know how it just landed. I was um, with uh, on a, I was in the Grampians actually with my girlfriend and uh, she she basically came up, she just threw it out there, came up with them and we're like, well, that's, that's it, Luna, L-U-N-A. Um, so Luna without the R. Uh, and that's kind of how it landed. Wow. Yeah. That's an interesting story. That's right? it. Any examples of the failed names? Do you remember any yep, of the... Yep, Gumboot. <laughs> <laughs> Tessa. <laughs> I'll name her. She came in one day and she's like, I've got it. Gumboot. <laughs> and we're like, well, okay. When that's happening, yeah, we're yeah. like, that is not Caterpillar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, bamboo was a cool one. I liked bamboo. Um, I don't know if you know bamboo, but it's, yeah. you know, it represents a bit like a, a startup. You know, you st- go, stays beneath the ground for a long right. time. Right, okay. And then shoots up like crazy after right. six six years. It's really cool. Yeah. But bamboo's not really, you know. Takes a bit of explanation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like yeah, you mentioned bamboo. There, right. So these are things we were playing with. Yeah. But yeah. And was the team receptive to that rebrand? So it started or? off as the coolest team exercise. So yeah. it started off with... Um, Everyone was so engaged and just loving it. And it was, uh, everyone was inspired and great coming up with names. I'm so involved in this business. And then because I was the leader, it ended up being frustration because I couldn't settle on a name and everything we had was crap. So it started off fun and then it just became frustration. Yeah. So uh, that's a good, that's a good segue to the last question that, yeah. that I have. It seems like you, you've created this company culture and company vibe that, that makes it seem like Luna's one big family. Uh, for you personally, how, how do you feel, you know, throughout the process of growing the company from one to 20 people? Does that bring pressure on yourself? And do you feel a sense of responsibility yeah. to look after your team? Yeah. Um, first of all, incredible pride and privilege. So I, I'd say this to the team all the time. It's, it's pretty cool when people uh, who you view as impressive, who, you know, our team are all... The, no one's turning up to work to work a job. Everyone, like each individual wants to be kick-ass at life. And it's pretty cool when people like that choose to come on board with your vision. So first of all, it's kind of a privilege to lead those people. Um, in terms of uh, how it differs from one to 20, like on a management style thing, well, we could have a whole podcast on that, yeah. right? <laughs> but it is like a fundamental change where, you know, your team's five, 10, and you can just inspire yourself and you, you, you work with everyone. You work on projects with everyone. Then all of a sudden when your team goes from 15 to 20, all of a sudden you're not working on a daily basis with everyone or even a weekly or a monthly basis. And how do you cut through with vision and um, inspiration and training and development and, uh, and all that's totally different. So, um, you know, we're in a phase now where, you know, we're, we're navigating that. As, as an internal team, um, you know, how we inspire. Um, it's unfortunate that I have, you know, partners now and each people, each person really has. So a core thing I do is work with the, the leadership team to make us better and they work with uh, the, their various teams to kind of implement the strategy and vision and engage people. But yeah, we, we're, we're a pretty um, dynamic group. We have strong internal values. So values and behaviors drives a lot of what we do. So our conversations are geared around our internal values mm. and the behaviors that we believe in. So we, you know, and that's coming up with that about a year ago was game changing for us. Awesome. Yeah. Renan, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Had a great time chatting with you. Loved it. If, if someone wanted to get in touch with you or with Luna, how should they do it? Yeah, just um, hit us up on the website, weareluna.co. Uh, there's contact forms there. Um, follow us on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn's like our main community engagement tool. Um, you can add me personally on LinkedIn, Renan Heine, R-O-N-E-N-H-E-I-N-E. Uh, and yeah, but our website is probably the best means, get in touch and we get anyone who contacts us, we have a call with. So get in touch. Awesome. Thank you, Renan. Great awesome. speaking with you. So much fun.